Hey, thanks for joining us online today. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We hope you enjoy this message. teaching series we're calling Making Change. And uh, I was thinking about this. uh, If we make one change, right, this month, one change, it could be a change that would affect our family, our career, and our walk with God. So uh, let's talk about it just for a minute. I want to take a poll. How many of you would say, I love change? I love new and different and fresh. Would you raise your hand? All right. Hands down. How many of you would say, I do not like change? I like predictability and stability, and also if it's not broke, amen. Raise your hand, would you? Okay, so I fall, you probably know this, I fall in probably the second group because my car is a 205 Honda Civic with 211,000. It's still running. Why would you change it? You know, I wear clothes out until they literally wear them out to the, to the point that if I wear a new shirt, everybody knows it, huh? And then, you know, it's like my routine is so boring because I get up early every day, I do my God time, I do a little exercise, I plan on my day, and I'm ready for the world. It's just like day after day after day, you know. Uh, But this is what I found out about myself in regards to change, and maybe you identify with this. Most of the time, maybe you identify with this, that I resist change, it's because it wasn't my idea. Hmm? It wasn't my idea, you know, and so um, I remember, you know, when our son, uh, who is now Pastor Mark of Epic Church, but I remember the day I got a call from him, you know, and he said, Dad, he said, I think God's calling me to ministry. He said, I would like to move back home and I would like you to mentor me. I mean, happy day, right? You can go to heaven when you get that conversation. And I'm looking up to heaven going, God, this is such a good change. And after they were here for a little bit, they had a child. Our first, you know, it was like our third grandchild, and I'm thinking, this is really just the greatest change. You know, and then Mark was here. He was growing. He was into his leadership position. We hired a new worship leader, and the church was moving, and it was shaking, and it was growing. And I'm thinking, really, really good change. Well, year three of Mark's stay here at the church, our coach, Nelson Searcy from New York City, called Mark and recruited him to come plan a church in New York City. I remember the day Mark came to me and he said, Dad, what do you think? I'm thinking, couldn't be God's will. (laughs) (laughs) Look, when your family moves back from North Carolina and they have a baby, change is good. When they decide to take that family to New York City, it can't be God's will, huh? But I found that this principle is really true. Listen close, right, when it comes to change in our life. And we're going to talk about giving to God today. But giving to God, it wasn't our idea. Our idea is to hoard. His idea was that we would give to him. And that's where some of the resistance comes from. So this is one of my favorite quotes of all time. And you've heard me say it. It's a filling on the message notes, right? If you always do. What you've always done, you always get what you've always gotten. I I often thought that ought to be a scripture verse. I'm really surprised God did not come up with that. And so, you know, this is what you do, right? If you come up with a phrase that's not a Bible verse, just say it's in Hezekiah. Because Hezekiah is not a book of the Bible. But when you're talking to people, they don't know that, you know. And so just say, I'm kidding. (laughs) Our hope in this message series has been this, that, that we would just at least open ourselves up and allow God to make at least one change in our life along the line of these thoughts. Ready? Less is better. Stress is bad. Tomorrow matters. And today, giving is good. As a matter of fact, let's just loosen up a little bit. Would you say those three words with me? Giving is good. Ready? One, two, three. 
You sounded convincing. So the memory verse, I'm going to ask you to read this out loud with me too, is found in the book of Acts. And uh, how about if we read this together, ready? You should remember the words of our Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now let me clarify. It's good to receive, isn't it? I mean, uh, when we first got married, uh, we had a lot of love and little possessions. I mean, our couch, our first couch was early Salvation Army and a Kmart throw cover. Do you understand? And we, and we had two TVs, but the TVs were not in the bedroom and in the living room. See, one of the TVs, the, the, the speaker worked, but the picture didn't. And the other TV, the picture worked, but the speaker didn't. And so we literally, to watch TV, we turned them both on at the same time. You know, uh, and so somebody gave us, believe it or not, this is going to so show you how old I am because we were so blessed by this. I remember somebody gave us a black and white 19-inch TV. That goes back, doesn't it? You didn't even know they made 19-inch. But there was this pig, and I remember we were like, praise God from whom all blessings flow, huh? Because of receiving that TV. But can I tell you what's even better than that? What's even better than that was the opportunity that God has given us as husband and wife to be able to give. I, I remember the first time that we gave money to a, a single mom who was recently divorced and had two kids. It was such a blessing to give. I remember the time that, that, uh, that my car was getting older, but there was another family that needed a car. I remember giving them a car. I remember one of the first times that we directed as a church, so we heard about a family who, whose child was in children's hospital, like long-term care. And I remember setting up meals for that family so that they didn't have to worry about meals where the kid was in the hospital. I remember stuff along the way in which he gave us this opportunity to give. I remember the first time, just for kicks, have you done this? I paid for the person behind me at McDonald's. I mean, it's priceless. Random acts of kindness, no strings attached. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Why? Because giving is good. Why don't you say that with me one more time? Giving is good. Yeah, so there is this guy named Paul who was a leader in the New Testament church after Jesus went back to heaven. And he was talking to the church at Corinth. And they were really struggling to give. And so he addressed the issue in their life. And this is what he said about giving to God to them. Follow along as I read. This is uh, uh, our memory verse, right? Or the verse after our memory verse in the notes. It says, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through this, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, if that's true, that we'll be enriched with generosity, if it's true that we will get more opportunities to give, if it's true that we would be thankful to God for those opportunities to give, then why don't we give more? <laughs> why don't we give more? And so I was thinking, you know, just in my own life, these are three reasons, right? We're struggling. Uh, we, might love, we might love to give. But right now, we're having trouble making ends meet. Our heart's in the right place, but we don't feel like we have the ability. And if we did give, we might not have enough. Uh, here's another reason. We've seen this message abused. You know how I know that? Because I've talked to people that think that all the church wants is your, you've heard them too, huh? And not only that, but there's TV preachers with slick hairdos. In $5,000 suits, they will tell you if you sow a seed of 100 bucks, you will get 1000 back, huh? Now, it, it, I don't know how you decide whether or not that you could trust a pastor, but if it's based on appearance, I don't have much hair. I have one black hand-me-down suit. I have a pair of black jeans that are good jeans. And I have one pair of blue jeans that are blue jeans. So if you base your stuff on that, you can trust me today, huh? You can trust me today. Some, though, though we have a scarcity mindset. And um, we, think it, we, we think if we give, there wouldn't be enough to go around. Now, I grew up in a house. So we, were, we were poor. There were five kids. And um, we measured out how much cereal to have in the morning. Anybody? 
I mean, we didn't like have a half a cup and we got a half a cup. But I had four, I had four siblings that watched very closely how much I put in my bowl, huh? And I put some back sometimes because I felt guilty. I took too much, you know. But I grew up with a scarcity mindset. And then the Bible introduced me to what I call an abundance mindset. An, an abundance mindset just simply says this, right? That uh, God says he has more. If we will trust him, he has more. In other words, if we give, we become a river in which it flows through rather than a reservoir in which we hoard. So the big idea, right, big idea of the message is when we give, we will be a blessing. And when we give, we will be blessed. So let's talk about this word because the word blessed is kind of like a, mm, like a churchy word. You know, so what do we mean when we talk about blessing? Uh, this is what I think. You know, I wrote down this definition. It, being blessed is a feeling of contentment and peace that comes when we're obedient. It's a feeling of contentment and peace that comes when we've been obedient to God. It may be just simply this, that we decide to give to somebody that was in need. And the blessing is nothing more than this, watching the expression on their face of gratefulness for the gift. It may be that, that, that blessing comes to us because we were at a period in our life where we clung to stuff really tight and now we begin to release it and a blessing comes when we hold things loosely. It may be because we had a change of the way we think. Instead of thinking that what's mine is mine and I'm going to keep it, somehow God changes that and we realize that what's mine is his and I'm going to give it today. It's where the blessing of God comes in. So there's a guy, he wrote the book of Proverbs. Now, I didn't put this scripture in the notes, but the guy that wrote the book of Proverbs said this. In Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. You can write that down. This is a great scripture. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. Listen to what he said. He said this. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. And the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Don't you love that? I mean, do you love the Bible? <laughs> I mean, the scriptures are like ageless. They're, they're generation to generation. They're culture to culture. They just kind of apply no matter where we're at in life. So when I was thinking about this message, making change, this is why making change is so critical, because it can lead to a blessed life. So say it with me one more time. Giving is good. A little more enthusiasm. That's good. So uh, uh, if that's true, if that's true, then how do we get better at it? How do we get better at giving to God? Well, I know what I've done in my life. When I wanted to get better at something, I looked for somebody who was doing it better than I was. And I began to imitate them. Uh, whether it was carpentry, whether it was learning to lead, whether it was preaching, whether it was golf. I watched them do what they did, and then I began to do what they did. So it's the same in this particular area of our life. So I want to introduce you to uh, a good giving model, a good giving church. And uh, the group I want to talk about today, they're called the Macedonian churches. You know why they were called the Macedonian churches? Because they were in Macedonian. It'd be like us saying that we are the church of western New York. So let me introduce you to them. Follow along as I read. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They were being tested by many troubles and they were very poor. But they were also filled with abundant joy, which overflowed into rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it on their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for all the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped. For the first action was to give themselves to the Lord and then to us, just as God wanted them to, to do. So let me just 
Let me just pull apart the scripture for a little bit. Just stay with it. You know, you might have to look in the message notes or maybe we get it back, back that up one. We'll get it back up on the screen. But uh, here, here's something, right? Verse 2 says they gave out of trouble. As a matter of fact, it says they gave out of many troubles. Verse 2 says again, they gave out of poverty. As a matter of fact, they were very poor. Verse four, 3 says they gave what they could afford and then some. Verse 4 says they gave willingly of their own free will. Verse 4 says they viewed it as a privilege. And verse 5 says that the giving flowed out of their relationship with God. Now, I was looking for a model to give to God. This one stuck out to me. It's such a great model. So in order to give to God, we have to change some of the ways that we understand giving. And that's what I'm really hoping for today. So here's one of the changes. Ready? We have to understand that giving was a matter of priority not a matter of problems. It's a matter of priority, not a matter of problems. So the scripture says in verse 2, they were being tested with many troubles. But they didn't let the circumstances of their life influence what they gave. In the midst of trouble, they were still giving. The day that we allow problems to control our giving is the day that our giving is restricted because we'll say, God, I'd like to give, but I don't have any time. We'll say stuff like, God, I would love to give to you, but I don't have any talent. We'll say stuff like, God, I'd love to give to you, but I don't have any treasure left to give to you. Here's the dilemma, right? Here's the dilemma. If we're waiting for a problem-free life before we start to give to God, we'll never give. You know why? There is no such thing as a problem-free life. As a matter of fact, let's just take a poll. This is just us this morning. How many of you had at least one problem in your marriage, with your family, or at work, or with a neighbor this last week? Would you raise your hand? Oh, you're so honest. You're more honest than the 830. Hey, they, this, but that's what, the, that's what the truth is. This is what the good news is, right? This is the good news. The problems that you have right now, you can solve them with a little bit of help. Or maybe on your own, or maybe from God. That's the good news. Can I tell you what the, the bad news is? There'll be more. <laughs> There'll be more because there is no such thing as a problem-free life. Now, this is true, right? If we wait for it, we'll never give. Now, are there times because of life situations that we can give more and because of life situations we can give less? Absolutely. The key is not to let them dictate whether we give or not. The second thing is this. Understand that giving is a matter of willingness, not a matter of wealth. <laughs> it's a matter of willingness, not a matter of wealth. For them, it had to be, those Macedonian churches, they had to, everything to do with their willingness and very little to do with their wealth. So let's do this for a minute, okay? Let's just forget about our wealth. Let's forget about how much time we have, how much talent we have, how much treasure we have, just for a minute. Because God is not interested in what you have. He's interested in what you do with what you have. See, this is true, isn't it? That, that we can be poor and be a bad giver. It's true, we can be rich and be a bad giver. We can do little with little, or we can do little with much. But the flip side of that coin is true. We can do much with little. And we can do much with much. It's a matter of willingness. So uh, a pastor preached a message like this, and a, uh, a farmer in his congregation came up to him afterwards and said, Pastor, if I had a million dollars, I'd give half of it to the church. And the pastor said, really? He said, let me ask you a question. If you had 1,000 cows, would you give 500 of them to the church? And the farmer said, sure would, pastor, sure would. He said, what if you had 400 chickens? Would you give 200 of them to the church? And the farmer said, I sure would, pastor, I sure would. And the pastor said, what if you had two hogs? Would you give one of them to the church? And the farmer said, Pastor, I have two hogs. 
Yeah, it's not a matter of what we have or what we don't have. Look at these Macedonian churches. It said they were also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed to rich generosity. You know, can I paraphrase that? Shoot, giving felt so good, I can't wait to do it again, huh? Last thing is this. Last thing is this. We have to understand that giving is a matter of opportunity, not a matter of obligation. Opportunity, not obligation. So look at this. Paul said, they begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers of Jerusalem. Um, they were saying to Paul, please let us give, please let us give, please let us give. And Paul's over there going, I didn't even want to ask you guys to give because you're poor. And they said, no, 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 where are the offering buckets? Where are the offering buckets? Now, uh, Akron Free is a generous church. What Brian just shared about VBS is a reflection of this church. It's a generous church. But I have to tell you, in 15 and a half years of ministry here at this church, I never had one person say to me, after we passed the buckets once, Pastor, could you do it one more time? <laughs> they just overflowed with generosity. So this is what the truth is. The giving mindset is grounded in this principle that we got to keep first things first we got to keep first things first it says in 2 Corinthians 8 5 following as I read this they did even more than we'd hoped for here's the key part for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and then to us just as God wanted them to do. Growing in generosity is not a budget issue or a calendar issue. It's a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual issue at its core. So uh, the secret in giving to God is that God would not only be our Savior, but He would be our Lord. You know what the difference is? You know, he becomes our savior when he, we invite him in the car. He gets in the car and we say, I'm going to drive. You sit in the back seat. How many of you know this about Jesus? He's the worst back seat driver you're ever going to run, you run into. Let him drive. I'm just telling you. Giving you a shortcut today, he wants to drive your life and just let him drive, okay? Things work out better when you let him drive. And so, you know, I, I thought about this, you know. Up until the time that I met my wife, Pam, my best diet, was hot dogs, bologna, chips, and sweets. I still prefer that today. And so we go out on this date, like to this nice restaurant, and on the menu is steak and chicken and fish. I don't even know what that stuff tastes like. And then a salad. And then the waitress asked me, she said, what kind of dressing would you like on your salad? I was like, whatever she has. <laughs> I didn't know the difference between ranch, blue cheese, or raspberry vinaigrette. I remember going home and my mom said, what would you have for dinner? I said, steak and salad. She said, I've been trying to get you to eat salad for 18 years. <laughs> what changed? I fell in love. I fell in love. You do know this, that love changes behavior. It's with one another, and it's with Jesus today. And so the deal is, you know, if we're asking ourselves, should I give or shouldn't I give? Am I exempt? How little can I give or how little can I do? The chances are, at the core of all that, is a love issue. It's a love issue that we make him number one in our life. So here's a common thought, right? Here's a common thought that I had, and I think every one of us have had, when it comes to give to God, and this is the thought, that in order to do that, I would have to rearrange my whole life around God. Pastor Rick, are you telling me to rearrange my whole life around God? Absolutely, that's what I'm telling you. The scriptures are clear. That is our worship. We worship him by giving the first part of every day. We worship him by giving him the first part of every week. We worship him by allowing our gifts to be used. One of the gifts I have that he has given me is the gift of encouragement. I'm a dealer in hope. 
And I dedicate that gift to God every day of my life. And we give him the first part of what he has blessed us with. Here's my journey. I'm not the only one that has this kind of story, but I told you I had a scarcity mindset, you know, and so uh, when Pam came to me and told me, you know, I think we need to start doing this thing of giving to God, I said, okay, here's what we'll do, hon. We'll give him the leftover. Whatever's left over at the end of the week, we'll give him the leftover. You know what the problem with that is? There was never anything left over. So we shifted gears and we said, we'll give him the first. We'll let it be our worship. We'll give him the first. And we've been just fine. The God that we serve will take care of us when we have a little and we give to him and he'll take care of us when we have a lot and we give to him. We give him our first and our best today and we trust him with the rest. So, you know, we back it out just for a minute. And so there's some of you today that, you know, you've heard about Jesus and you actually believe that he existed. But before you ever think about giving to God, would you make him your savior? You know he died for the whole world, but can I tell you today, he died for you. <laughs> he died for you. You say, how do I do that, Pastor Rick? It's as simple as these nine words. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Lord, would you be my Savior today? Will we pray that prayer of repentance. He becomes our Savior. But there are others in the room. You know, he's already your Savior. And the given issue isn't whether he's your Savior. It's whether or not you're letting him drive. Whether he's your Lord. You say, how do I get right with that? Same way, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Please forgive me. So let me give you just some counsel along this line, right? Um, because it, it is a big jump. If Jesus is not a budget item, it's a big chunk. So do this. Give to him for the first time. Then muster up enough courage and faith to give to him on a regular basis. And then just start giving him a portion of that today. You all right? So I'm going to leave you some time today just to pray. You know, if you need to ask Jesus to be your Savior, then please do that. If you need to ask him to be your Lord, do that. Maybe there's another part of this giving, giving thing, you know, maybe it has to do with willingness or maybe it has to do with opportunity. You pray about that issue for the next few minutes. Thanks. I'm going to ask you to do something that we haven't done in a while with your eyes closed. Um, would you do this? Uh, would you repeat this prayer after me? Okay, just say it out loud after I say it. God, I thank you for blessing me with my time, my talent, and my treasure. Help me, Lord. Surrender all those to you first. In Jesus' name.